Hi there, I'm Jeremy Krug, and in this video we're going to take a look at Unit 6, Sections 2 and 3. Now, in Section 2, we're going to be looking at heat and how uh, heat can change over the course of a chemical reaction. Now, earlier in our last video, we talked about heat and how that's often called thermal energy. And in AP Chemistry, Specifically, there's a type of heat or a type of thermal energy that we're interested in that's called enthalpy. Now, specifically, that's the energy or the heat that is associated with the bonds. Different bonds have different amounts of heat energy, different amounts of enthalpy in them. Now, that's a little different than the concept of temperature. Now, you and I both know that you know, temperature is basically just how hot or how cold something is. In uh, chemistry and science, we might measure that in kelvins or degrees Celsius. Some of us might use degrees Fahrenheit or even some other unit of, of uh, temperature. But when we say temperature, what we're actually measuring is the average kinetic energy of the particles. Now this is important because on the AP exam, they like to ask a question or, or sometimes multiple questions about this. And they'll ask you, uh, perhaps you'll have two samples of, of matter, and they'll ask you which of these two samples of matter has the greatest average kinetic energy in the molecules. And the answer is whichever one has the higher temperature. Average kinetic energy is, is just a fancy way of saying temperature. If you have two samples that have the same temperature, that means the molecules have the same average kinetic energy. That's all that means. And I point that out because that does come up quite a bit on the AP curriculum and the exam. Now, most reactions that we're going to deal with in chemistry are exothermic. Like we said in the last video, that means that heat will be released from the system into the surrounding. So what that means is, is if you have your hand next to it, it's going to feel warm because that heat is being released into the surroundings. Now graphically, what that means is that the reactants have chemical bonds that have higher enthalpy overall than the products do. So if you were to draw this graphically, this is what it looks like. You have a higher enthalpy state at the beginning and then a total lower enthalpy state at the end. And that means that over the course of the reaction, the, the substances here will be losing enthalpy. So that's why the change in enthalpy is a negative value. It's less than zero. Now, here in our upcoming videos, we're going to learn how we actually calculate a numerical value for that. Now, I do I want to point out to you that exothermic reactions are um, the most common. In fact, as we talk about driving forces later on in Unit 9 of this course, we'll say that the fact that a reaction is exothermic is what we call a driving force for that reaction. In other words, the universe kind of uh, likes exothermic reactions. They are the, the most common type of reaction. We'll talk uh, about another driving force in Unit 9. Now, like I said, there are other types of reactions. There are endothermic reactions. And what that means is that the system ends up absorbing heat from the surroundings into the system. So if you have your hand next to an endothermic process, it's going to feel cold to the touch. Now graphically what that means is the reactants start out with a lower enthalpy and then over the course of the process you gain, you have a higher enthalpy. Now you can probably tell that that means that we're gaining, so that's why change in enthalpy is a positive number. It's going to be greater than zero. Now, uh, endothermic reactions, of course, do exist, but since they require substances to increase their enthalpy state, that's not typical from a thermodynamic point of view. Of course, th endothermic reactions do take place, and that's because of another driving force, which we'll talk about in Unit 9. Now, let's move right on to Section 6.3, and this section uh, discusses how substances change temperature, I should say. Now let's imagine that we have a nice hot bowl of chicken noodle soup or whatever your, your favorite soup might be. 
And if you were to take the temperature of that hot soup, you'd find it probably would have a temperature of, yeah, let's say about 360 Kelvin. So that's a, a fairly hot bowl of soup. Now, let's say that instead of eating the soup, we just leave that soup right there on the table, maybe on the dining room table, on a perhaps in a classroom, and we just leave and we close the door and we leave and we go home. Well, what's going to happen to the temperature of that soup? Well, we know that the surrounding air is cooler than the soup. It has a temperature of probably around 295 kelvins. Well, we know that if we just leave that soup in the room overnight, when we come back the next day, maybe 10 hours later, the temperature of that soup is going to have dropped significantly, right? Down to, let's say, 296 kelvins. Now, how does this happen? Well, we know that the temperature of the soup is going to drop. But guess what? There is a, a flow of heat. That heat flows from the soup to the surrounding air. So that means that the temperature of the soup goes down, the temperature of the air goes up slightly until they equilibrate in the middle and the air is also going to have that same final temperature of 296 kelvins after about 10 hours or so. So the, these two things, the air and the soup, will eventually have the same temperature. Now how does this happen? How does heat flow from one material to another? Well, it has to do with the molecules colliding themselves. And so let's imagine that we have some molecules in the soup. I have those in the red here, and those are the warmer molecules. And then there's the air around the soup, which is cooler. I have that represented by the blue molecules here. Now we know that when warmer particles from that soup collide with the cooler particles from the air, there's going to be some energy transfer. And that's because the hot soup molecules are moving faster and the cooler air molecules are going slower. So when the soup molecules collide with the air molecules, the hot soup molecules transfer some of their kinetic energy to the air molecules. And so that cools down the soup molecules and warms up the air molecules. Now, if enough of these collisions take place, over enough time. It might take a while, it might take several hours, but eventually enough energy transfer is going to occur so that on average, eventually, the soup particles are going to have the same kinetic energy as the air particles. And so instead of having this temperature differential, it'll be more like this, where the, the soup molecules have the same temperature as the air molecules. I hope You've learned something about uh, sections two and three here in unit six. If you have, please slam that thumbs up button and join me in the, in the next video where we're, we're going to go on to unit six, section four. Thanks for watching.